Welcome to Contenders Bible School Bibliology and How to Study the Bible. Our five-step Bible study method of first doing a word study, which is called an exegesis, and then doing a circumstantial study, is followed by a biographical study. You've completed the exegesis and the circumstantial and the biographical studies, so now we'll review the biographical study assignment. When we do a biographical study, we're studying the author of the passage, and then we're studying others who might be named or alluded to in the passage. This is to bring a personal context to the study, and it also allows us to apply the second rule of hermeneutics, which is the writer's context. We want to understand the writer, and we want to understand how the writer used the words that they used. The biographical study written assignment was, first of all, to list everyone who was identified in the passage. You might have noticed that God the Father was mentioned. You might have noticed that Jesus was mentioned. The Holy Spirit was mentioned, too. But so was the Antichrist and even the devil. Cain was mentioned. Abel was mentioned, but not by name, only by reference to being Cain's brother. False prophets were mentioned, as well as false spirits. Were there any others that were mentioned? You might want to discuss this. The second part of the assignment was to write a paper describing the change that took place in John. I assigned you John for your biographical study. I wanted you to look at young John the disciple and see how he became the aged Apostle John. Young John is found in the three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There we see him as being brash and youthful. Along with his brother James, they were named the Sons of Thunder because they wanted to call fire down on a city that had rejected them. They were part of the inner circle. It was Peter and it was James and John who went with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration. It was Peter, James, and John who went steps further in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed before his crucifixion. Something else that we notice about John, and I hope that you pick this up, he had a close affinity to Peter, more so than his brother James, and I think probably even more than his affinity for Jesus. I see him following Peter all the time. That's something that stood out to me, especially um, as we realize that really the important person in the narrative is Jesus. And I wondered, why is he always following Peter? And in fact, I would think if anything, a younger brother would be following his older brother. For whatever the reason, John latched on to Peter. But when we read the Gospel of John, it's a different thing. The Gospel of John was written by John, but it was not written by young John the disciple. It was written by old John, the aged apostle. It was written toward the end of his life, toward the close of the first century. It was written on purpose, and it was written with a purpose. And the purpose is stated. John says, I could have written a lot of things about Jesus. In fact, the world couldn't contain the books that could be written. But I've chosen to write these things so that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing you might have life in his name. He gives us his purpose. This is not something that young people do. Young people are not purposeful. Young people live their lives as though there were no tomorrow. People who are older realize that there might not be a tomorrow and they live their lives very carefully and very purposefully. And so that teaches me something, too, about 1 John. In the Gospel of John, John presents Jesus as the Son of God. 
That is his stated purpose, and he does that quite well. In the seven miracles that he chooses, miracles that the other gospel writers do not record, John is laying out the evident deity of Jesus Christ. But interestingly enough, John's gospel always has Jesus referring to himself as the Son of Man. Because you see, these things were very important to John, combating the error of Gnosticism as he was. He wanted to make sure that people understood Jesus is God of very God. He was from the beginning. He always was with the Father. He is God. But he also wanted us to understand Jesus' humanity was complete. Jesus is not only the Son of God, but he is the Son of Man. Now John never refers to himself in his gospel as John. He refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. On a first read through that, you might think that is ego. You might wonder, well, what kind of guy is this that refers to himself as, well, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved, as though he didn't love the others, or at least he loved John more than he loved the others. Was this ego, or was this a revelation that dawned on him now that he'd been walking with Jesus in the Spirit? Remember before, he was walking with Jesus in the flesh, but he was walking following Peter. So the insight that I get into the Apostle John is this. John now realizes who Jesus was. I don't think he realized then. Jesus was more than just a prophet, more than just a great prophet. John now as an older man who has walked in the Spirit all of these years, realize what it was that he witnessed, what it was that he saw with his eyes, what it was that he actually touched with his hands, what it was that he heard with his ears. He didn't have an appreciation for it as a young man, perhaps even in his late teens. But John now realizes that Jesus loved him. I don't know if John got that then. I don't know if the young John understood the love of Jesus, but now he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now he gets it. Now he says, he loved me. And John now has fellowship with Jesus, and he has fellowship with the Father, and he has fellowship with the Spirit of God. He had all of those things as a young man, but his fellowship was directed toward Peter. Peter captured his interest. He had Jesus right there at hand. He had a relationship with the Father because Jesus said to Philip, Phil, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John didn't get it any more than Philip did. He already had the Spirit. Jesus had breathed on his disciples and he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. But John didn't understand any of those things as a young person. But now, as a mature Christian, now as someone who has walked in the Spirit all of these years, he realizes not only does Jesus love him, but he has a real-time relationship with God the Father and Jesus the Son through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Further insight. All the rest are gone. Peter... James, the rest of the apostles, Mary, the mother of Jesus, all gone. Remember while he hung on the cross, Jesus pointed to John and he pointed to Mary and he indicated that John was to take her and to take care of her as though this was his mother. But now she's gone. But he has fellowship with the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Look. I'm with you to the very end. Fellowship with the Father through Jesus in the Holy Spirit has become the message of John's life. This then is the message that we've heard of him.
And John wrote 1 John so that he could share that message of fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Our five-step Bible study method involves a word study called an exegesis, a circumstantial study, a biographical study, and then a topical study before we get to the paraphrase part where we put it in our own language. You've already completed an exegesis and a circumstantial and biographical study, and now it's time to do a topical study. Topical studies, plural? Well, yes, plural, because there is usually more than one topic found in a passage, and if we're going to do a good job, then all of those topics should be studied. Plenary inspiration mandates topical studies. Do you remember plenary inspiration when we talked about inspiration? We talked about verbal inspiration where every word of the Bible is inspired. And that's why we need to do an exegesis. We need to do a word study. But plenary inspiration says that all of the Bible, the whole of the Bible in substance and in structure is inspired. And so that mandates that we study the topics all the way through the Bible. And also remember the fundamental principle of hermeneutics is that the Bible is its own best interpreter. The Bible is its own best commentator. So any doctrine of the Bible is a doctrine of the whole Bible, the plenary inspired revelation of God, and not a doctrine of one or two verses. We don't want to do what's called proof texting, where you just take a verse and then you try to prove a doctrine from that. So with topical studies, we search all of Scripture to let the Bible be its own best commentator. Now here are two steps to topical studies. First of all, we need to find the topics suggested by the passage being studied. And then we need to write them down. Writing down is very important. You won't remember, you need to write it down. So as we go through the passage, we want to note any themes of the passage. Uh, we want to note especially the main theme, if there is one, and there usually will be one. We want to look for the expressed purpose of the writer. Now, that might be inferred, and it might be deduced if it's not expressed. So, even if the purpose of the writer is not expressed, and in John's case, he comes right out and tells us why he's writing what he's writing, but sometimes in a passage, if we don't have that, we can still infer, infer or we can still deduce the purpose of the writer. Now, you need to note any keywords of the passage as well. Look for any repeated words or concepts, any emphasized words or concepts. So something that's repeated or something that has extra emphasis to it gives us a, a suggestion then as to what the topics might be. And we want to write those topics down. That's step one. Step two will be to study each of the topics found in the passage. We need to outline the scope of each topic separately. For example, the topic of love has many subtopics. And so we want to identify those subtopics and we want to write them down. You need to actually get out paper, get out pen, write these topics down and then identify the subtopics. And then study one subtopic at a time. For an exhaustive study, you're going to repeat this for all of the subtopics for each topic in the passage. So topical studies can get really deep. They can become really complex because we're not just doing this within the passage we're considering. We're now taking and going from the passage we're considering and we're studying the whole Bible. And as if that weren't enough, we also want to study antithetical topics. That means the opposite. So if I really wanted to be complete and I was studying a passage that 
had the word love in it, I would be looking at all these different subtopics of love, you know, the, the love that God has for us, the love we have for God, the love of a husband for a wife, the love between brothers. Uh, but I would also want to study the antithetical topic to love, which would be hate. Or there are some others that are incidental too, that are similar, um, like envy. Um, and I might even take one that is not necessarily antithetical the way people look at it, but it's definitely antithetical to the way God looks at it, and that's lust or desire. So we want to identify then all of these subtopics. We want to write them down, and then we want to study them, each one of them, throughout the whole scripture. So those are the two steps. Okay? The first step is to find the topics. The second step is to look for the subtopics to outline them. Well, what are the tools that we can use to do this? Well, the first of all is a concordance. Strong's exhaustive concordance that lists every word of the King James Version. And you can look up your topic there, find every place that English word is used. For example, if you were to take the word love, you could look up every time that word love appeared, but that would be the English word. Um, you can also use Young's analytical concordance, and there are others too. You can use online concordances, they will help you. One that is included in ESORD is the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, which is a parallel passage finder, and that will help you to be able to study these subtopics in other places in Scripture. Topical Bibles help. Knave's Topical Bible, as well as a Thompson Chain Reference Bible. If I were going to suggest any Bible, and people ask me at different times, which Bible should I get, I'm not as concerned about which translation you should get as to which study Bible you should get. And I would recommend that you get a Thompson's Chained Reference. Because in the last third of Thompson's Chained Reference Bible, you will find a cyclopedic index of topics with their subtopics, and with scripture references that will chain you all the way through the Bible. And you can follow a topic all the way from, from Genesis through Revelation. For example, the topic koinonia, the, the Greek word koinonia, is translated in your English translations as fellowship, as communion, as participation, as partnership, as benevolence. There are a lot of different English words that are translating this one Greek word, koinonia. We could map that topic out as the difference between heavenly and earthly fellowship or communion, uh, eternal or temporal, spiritual or physical. This is the way we could map it out, but if I were to look at subtopics, Right here in 1 John, for example, you understand the word fellowship is a very key word there in that passage, 1 John 1.1 1, 1 through 2.2. 2. And having done your exegesis, you probably ran into that Greek word koinonia. Well, I see that the fellowship we're talking about there is the fellowship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and also our fellowship with the Father and with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. So those are all subtopics. Another subtopic would just be the fellowship between God and man. There is also the idea of a fellowship between believers and unbelievers, a fellowship between believers and the works of darkness. And it's even cast as fellowship between light and darkness. So these are subtopics, and there are other subtopics that you could find uh, to write about with fellowship. But what I want you to do is to pick one of the subtopics of fellowship that is actually found in 1 John. Sometimes when I've given this an assignment, and this is your assignment, I've had people come up with all kinds of crazy subtopics about fellowship. You know, um, I'm not really interested in your fellowship with pizza. Um, I'm not interested in your fellowship or the fellowship between your dog and your cat. I'm interested in 
the subtopics that are there in 1 John 1.1 1, 1 through 2.2. 2. This is the passage now that we are studying for this class. So here is your assignment. I want you to study the topic of quinonia. In fact, I'd like you to learn how to say the word quinonia, and I'd like for you to learn how to recognize quinonia in the Greek. You don't have to, but I just think it would be a great idea. I've even seen people name their boats Koinonia, fellowship, and I've, you know, fellowship, and I've seen them actually write it in the Greek, and I thought that was a pretty cool name for a boat. So I want you to identify the subtopic that you want to study. I'm picking the topic. Now there's more than just this one topic in 1 John 1, 1 through 2, 2. Um, but I'm picking the topic for you of koinonia, but I want you to identify the subtopic, but it needs to be a subtopic that is actually there in that passage. And then I want you to study that exhaustively from Genesis through Revelation. So take care of your subtopic. I mean, you can get really big. This can become a real big study. And I want you to take notes while you're doing this study. I, and then I want you to write a paper expressing what you've learned. So you're going to identify your subtopic. Then you're going to study that exhaustively. You can do it with a concordance. You can do that with uh, the treasury of scripture knowledge. That will help you. Uh, you can do that also using Knave's Topical Bible. If you don't have a Knave's Topical Bible, you can find one online that you'll be able to use for free. Um, if you don't have a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, um, I suggest you get one. Because if you're going to go into the ministry and you're going to preach, you will find that to be just a wonderful aid. You will... You will thank me so much for suggesting that you get a Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Then you're going to take notes while you're studying. Don't forget to do that because those notes then will become the basis for you writing down what you've learned. 